I'm Jonathan All, and this is a special edition of The Gateway. It's been 10 years since Michael Brown Jr. was killed and the Ferguson uprising that followed. To honor that history and reflect on where St. Louis is today, St. Louis Public Radio is bringing back the podcast, We Live Here for a Special Season. In the show, hosts Chad Davis and producer Danny Wisentowski reflect on some of the truths that Ferguson exposed, why there's still an open wound a decade later, and how community members continue to push for a better future. Today on The Gateway, we're going to bring you the second episode of this special season. Many people found their power and voices during the Ferguson Uprising. Some used streaming technology and found themselves defining their own class of media with no editors and no rules. They brought the story of the Ferguson Uprising live to our computers and smartphones. Their dispatches from the front lines kept viewers up to date while the national news played catch up. Their stories didn't end in 2014, though, as many of them in the St. Louis area continued to demonstrate for causes to the present or until their deaths. You can hear the rest of the season of We Live Here over the next several weeks on our app, our website, stlpr.org, or wherever you get podcasts. Here's Chad Davis. I want to tell you about a photograph. The photograph. The one that tells the story of the Ferguson Uprising. It shows a man in a moment of intense action, a throw driving his body forward. When I look at this photo, the first thing I notice is his right hand, grasping a tear gas canister, it's pouring smoke and fire and casting a blinding bright light on the man's body. His hair, long dreadlocks are flung over his face. We can't see the rest of his features. We can see that he's black and we can see his outfit, an American flag shirt. It's not a small design on the pocket. No, 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 no. It's over the entire shirt. He's essentially wearing the stars and stripes. Now, let's look at his left hand. You could almost miss it at first glance, but yeah, he's holding a bag of chips. And these aren't just any chips. These are red hot riblets, the St. Louis chip. And the bag's top is open. It tells a story. A man mid-snack interrupted by tear gas on the streets of Ferguson. And the throw? To where? The photo doesn't say. Its frame is zeroed in on the figure. Beyond some blurry background figures, nothing else exists. The photo is from August 13th, 2014. Taken not long after midnight, it's just four days after the killing of Mike Brown. At this point, no one knows the name Darren Wilson the Ferguson officer who killed him. Months later, a grand jury will decide to not indict Wilson. But on this evening, outrage is building. This night will set off a kind of pattern for the coming months, the mass arrest and clouds of tear gas. This photo somehow captures all of that. It's published that same night, going instantly viral on Twitter. In the next days and weeks, It's seen in newspapers and websites and social media posts all across the world, viewed by millions. But at first, no one knows the identity of its American flag-wearing subject. Not even the St. Louis Post-Dispatch photographer who took the photo, Robert Cohen, knows his name. Online, he became known as the man with the chips. But Cynthia Crawford, she knew. And even 10 years after the photo was taken, after appearing in textbooks and murals and t-shirts and tattoos, after winning a Pulitzer Prize, when Cynthia looks at this photo, she, well, she sees what a mother sees. I see my baby. What stands out to me is just him just tossing it, you know, his his hair, his, you know, just him. Courage. <laughs> On the day of the photo, Edward Crawford is 27 years old. To his parents, Cynthia and Edward Sr., he's not some famous symbol. Here's his dad. We called him Skeeter. That was his nickname. Skeeter was the life of the party, wherever he went, wherever he, I mean, he just loved life. He loved bringing laughter and joy to anyone that knew him. That night, Edward Crawford, Skeeta, joins the protest. The next day, the photo of Edward Skeeta Crawford is everywhere. When I first seen it, 
and and I looked at it, and it's just that's so courageous, you know, what he did, the act that he did, was to protect the the children behind our closed doors. That's what he told me. It was like, you know, and that's what I believe. It went so fast that I really couldn't even grasp it all at one time. But because when I saw the picture, he called me and told me that the picture was out there. I said, son, I said, it was a great thing you did. And uh, I'm proud of you. But uh, he, he didn't look at it like that. That's the thing about a photo. Even an iconic one that seems to contain an entire story about a man and a bag of chips and a tear gas canister. What it doesn't show is what happened before he picks it up. Or, zooming out, the people around him, including children in the immediate area. It doesn't show what happened after he makes the throw. His arrest, the police. They beat him. When I see my baby the next day, after they let him out, His face was swollen, you know. His uh, eye was bloodshot. Assaulted and everything. He's telling me Mm -hmm. they tried to shove their uh, batons up his rectum, you know, but he had to close his legs so tight so they wouldn't. I mean, it was horrible. Then they made up this story that when he drew it back, it hit a police officer, and the police officer had to be taken to emergency room, but they made a big thing about it because he stood up for others and they didn't like that. It didn't matter though what the police thought of the photo. It was viral. It was worldwide. 11 days after being photographed throwing a tear gas canister, Skeeta is interviewed by Brian Stelter on CNN for a national audience in his first TV appearance. On screen, he's standing in front of the Ferguson Police Department. And you guessed it, he's wearing the same American flag shirt that he wore in the photo. So what were you doing with the canister? Were you throwing it at the police? No, sir, I was not throwing the canister at the police. I was merely getting the the canister away from me and the kids. Um, The canister was thrown not in the police direction. It was thrown on another part of the sidewalk. He doesn't try to make the protests about him or his famous photo, even when asked about the sudden attention it had brought. I am happy that the media is in my town because this attention that we're getting, I just hope that we turn into something positive. With the attention, I hope our voices are heard and I hope our pain is felt by America. There is more to the story and life of Edward Skeeter Crawford and his famous photo. And there was something else happening in Ferguson in 2014, something those camera crews and reporters and editors were only starting to understand something they couldn't keep up with. I'm Chad Davis. This is We Live Here, 10 years after the Ferguson Uprising. On this episode, we're going to focus on the people who found their power and voices in the midst of a civil rights uprising. People who, very quickly, found themselves defining their own class of media, with no editors and no rules. To tell those stories, I want you to meet a reporter who covered Ferguson on the ground 10 years ago for the Riverfront Times. He's a producer on We Live Here, and his name is Danny Wisentowski. As a reporter covering the protests in Ferguson and St. Louis, I watched a lot of videos like this one. It starts with the crack of a tear gas canister flying through the air. The camera follows the bouncing, burning canister, which stops down the street at the feet of a man in dark clothing. He stoops and, in one smooth motion, launches it right back where it came from. It lands in a line of police officers in riot gear, bathing them in their own smoke. That's tear gas. It's August 19th, 2015. Earlier this day, an 18-year-old black teenager, Mansour Balbay, was shot dead by St. Louis police officers. Authorities said he pointed a pistol at them as he ran away, so the officers shot him in the back. That night, hundreds take to the streets to protest. 
These sorts of videos, they could be 30 seconds or four hours long on YouTube, Twitter, or on websites like Ustream or Livestream. They showed me where protests were underway, a sudden mass arrest, a banner drop in an NFL game, a highway shutdown during rush hour traffic. These videos aren't iconic, like a Pulitzer Prize photo can be. There's not that focused, frozen moment. In motion, these scenes are messy, loud, blurry. But they felt so real back then. Often, when I opened my phone or computer, it was live. I think the real draw was the fact that people could watch things transpire in real time. They could get a real, live account of what's going on right then and there in the seconds of it. I think that's really what draw a lot of people to live streams as opposed to, you know, having to wait for the mainstream media to come up with a video package and edit stuff out and edit stuff in and get comments from people and splice all that stuff together. That's Brian Redman, a citizen journalist and sometimes live streamer during the Ferguson protests. Brian is a good example of the way that citizen journalists challenged the old definitions of journalism. He didn't have a huge following. 500 to 1,000 viewers was a lot for him. On one hand, he was an observer, getting footage of arrests and protests. On the other, Brian was a protester. He's in the video I just played for you, the guy giving the police a taste of their own tear gas. That's Brian making the throw. Mansur Balbay's death, I, um, I was filming that day, and they shot me in the back with a rubber munition. And, um, well, it, it pissed me off, basically. It, it hurt really bad, but I was more angry about it than I was, than I was hurt. So <clears throat> they started throwing tear gas canisters at us. They started shooting them at us. Um, so, and so several of the people were picking them up and throwing them back at the police line. And I was one of those people. I picked up a tear gas canister and chucked it right back at them because they shot me in the back. That's definitely something I never did in my capacity as a professional journalist, which was the role I was very new at at the time. I was barely a year into my first real job as a staff writer with the Riverfront Times. We were a small paper. I was one of two staff writers. And from the moment I got to Ferguson, I was surrounded by citizen journalists like Brian. It was unmissable, even to a rookie like me. Because also around me was a vast army of mainstream professional media at every level competing for ratings, for audience, local and national, TV, print, radio, international outlets, film crews, all taking a very traditional approach. It felt disorienting. Citizen journalists didn't seem to have an audience in the way that I understood it. They weren't competing. They were out there. Their audience was finding them. And they were beating the news cycle every day. In my spare moments between reporting and writing, I'd be checking the feeds, refreshing Twitter accounts, making sure I was up to date and not missing anything. The first account I'd check was Miss Jupiter on Twitter. Her real name is Heather DeMayan. I would consider myself to be an independent photojournalist. I think... Uh, the, the Guardian called me a videographer one time, which I thought was a little lofty for a live streamer, but... <laughs> Heather didn't start as a live streamer. The day after Mike Brown's death on August 10th, she attended a vigil near the site of the shooting. She says she watched police antagonize the crowd by driving through them. I mean, it was completely peaceful. It was the next thing I knew, there, there was just, from the outer edges, there were people there was people being shoved and stuff and cops just like showed up with dogs and gas masks for no reason, drove through the crowd, angered, seriously, severely angered people. Heather wasn't the only live streamer who had their eyes opened by watching how police treated the residents, community members and protesters on the streets of Ferguson. Ohan Ashe never thought of herself as a live streamer or protester. None of that was in her social media feed earlier in the summer of 2014. I was posting the most unserious content that there was. Um, for example, I was really into like pop culture things. So a lot of things about celebrities, a lot of things about like what was going on in like reality TV. I was also Greek. So my timeline was like obnoxiously about Delta Sigma Theta. 
Ohan had just recently graduated from Southeast Missouri State University. She'd landed a job as a corporate videographer. I remember scrolling on Twitter and I saw the picture of the stepfather holding the sign that Ferguson police officer just killed my unarmed son. Um, and that was one of the first things that was very captivating. And I just remember like scrolling on social media, calling friends like, hey, did you hear about this? Because this is our community. This is our neighborhood. I don't think anything like this had happened so close to us before. Ohan was outraged by Brown's killing but also alarmed that on August 10th, her community looked unrecognizable. After the police response, a candlelight vigil that night had turned into a riot, producing some of the other iconic photographs of the early Ferguson unrest. Bystanders and journalists shared images of people breaking into a quick trip convenience store. Someone lit fire to the structure. The entire gas station burned and more businesses were looted and burned that night. Ohan remembers feeling angry. The next day, she went to the scene with her sorority. They were one of several groups that came out to clean up the damage. And sometimes it's like a little embarrassing to say, but at the time I was very mad at the community because I felt like this was the quick trip I went to. This is where I got my gas. This is the street that I walk down all of the time and it's destroyed. But Ohan's anger at her community was short-lived. On August 13th, just hours after Edward Crawford's immortalizing photo, Owen drives to Ferguson straight from work. She brings her camera. This is that day where it was a ton of media there. CNN, MSNBC, all of those uh, people were there. And the police were once again being very difficult to the crowd. So I was really just trying to like capture that. And it was an instance in particular that was going on because at this time they had a lot of the side streets blocked off. The police had shut down a major portion of West Florissant Avenue cutting off residents from their apartments and homes. And it was this elderly man on crutches, and he was trying to walk home, and they wouldn't let him go in the direction of his home. And they ended up pulling him by his blue lanyard around his neck, pulling him down and arresting him. And I had never seen anything like it. They formed this like circle around him, so you couldn't really see what was going on. And then they had like a line in front of that, so you couldn't really get a good picture of it. So I'm sitting there with like the CNN guy with like my little Canon camera trying to get the footage of what was going on. And because of that, they arrested me and I got kind of swept in that media arrest of the day. I'm not disturbing every, anything at all. I'm not disturbing anything. It's my right. Take, I'm good at it. Could authorities have arrested their way out of this uprising? Well, it certainly felt like they tried. It reached absurd proportions, like the five-second rule from October 2014, an official police policy that said protesters had to be moving at all times during demonstrations, and if they stopped, even for five seconds, they would be arrested. That policy was challenged by the ACLU, and it was later thrown out by a judge. But the mass arrests didn't stop. Ohan was arrested multiple times. Heather DeMayan, who uses a wheelchair, was dumped on the ground and arrested in Ferguson. In 2015, I watched as protesters left a highway after blocking traffic, only to find police waiting to arrest them in mass in the parking lot. I watched an officer trip and slam a legal observer to the ground, and another threaten a protester who was having a seizure that she would be arrested if she went to a hospital. The arrests didn't stop the protests that summer or the following years. Their roots grew deeper in St. Louis. And there's at least one good reason why. Black people kept getting killed by police. 10 days after Mike Brown's death, two St. Louis City police officers killed Kajime Powell, a 25-year-old with schizophrenia. Also that year, 24-year-old Von Derrick Myers was killed by a St. Louis City police officer who was working private security for a neighborhood. I already mentioned 18-year-old Mansour Balbay and the protests that erupted after his death. That year, in 2015, the center of protest intensity had moved 
from Ferguson to the streets of St. Louis. Ohan Ashe moved with them, always filming. In one of her videos, posted to Instagram on January 16th, 2015, protesters are blocking a street in St. Louis City demanding justice for Von Derrick Myers. A police officer is trying to convince them to move. The cop is all concern. He says, what if an ambulance comes by? A protester responds with a counterpoint. Von Derrick Myers didn't even get a chance at an ambulance. There ain't no I mean, ambulance coming up there. There's one we lost through. I'm saying that there's not one right the second. I mean, I'm by saying, everybody, you get a chance to get in the ambulance. I'm just saying. In 2017, Ohun took on a new role. Under the name Expect Us, she and others helped organize a movement. She led protests. And she used her voice. The protests of 2017 were about another police shooting of a black man, but years before Mike Brown. In 2011, St. Louis City Police Officer Jason Stockley shot and killed Anthony Lamar Smith after a car chase. The case lay dormant for years. And then, in a surprise twist, the city's top prosecutor charged Stockley with murder. It was the first time in the city's history that an officer faced trial for an on-duty killing. In September 2017, after that trial, a judge acquitted Stockley of all charges. Protests erupted, and Owen wasn't just there to film the protests. This time, she organized them. You could feel the importance. You can feel the change that you were making. It's nothing else mattered than continuously showing up, showing what was going on, and making sure that what mainstream media might have been telling wasn't necessarily the truth most of the time. So it was like this obligation that we had to share the truth. There were moments during that year of protest in 2017 when Owen wondered about what would happen to St. Louis afterward. What would happen to her and her community? I've always felt like um, St. Louis, and specifically Black St. Louis, has so many amazing things going on. But it was this narrative at the time that we did not. It was very negative about the Black community. Um, I think, like, crime was rising, and that was what the focus was on. And I was like, no, we have all of these businesses. We have all of these events. And what about if we had this centralized location where you can find these things? The idea became For the Culture STL, an online hub for black culture and businesses in St. Louis. It's just turned six years old with hundreds of thousands of visitors and annual events that have brought people together in real life, not just online. These days, Owen's videos sound more like this. If you're living in St. Louis, did you know we have an all-black, proud-to-be-black pharmacy that's sitting in our own community? Today we're at Greater Health Pharmacy and Wellness, so let's go inside. And her recent live streams celebrate community, like this video from a 314 Day celebration. That's a day to showcase St. Louis pride. It shows a crowd of people taking a group photograph at the Gateway Arch. Drop your neighborhood, St. Louis, in the comments. Hey! Northside, baby! <laughs> Northside! This is Ohun's post-protest career. She's not risking arrest on the streets of Ferguson. She's not inhaling tear gas. Still, she says in many ways, this new community feels like her protest one. The community is hand-in-hand. -hand. In some ways, it's the exact same. And in some others, it has expanded in a lot of ways because For the Culture also touches things that activism does, but also things that we may think sit outside of activism, Black-owned businesses, community events. Ohun hasn't retired as a live streamer, but she knows that the next generation, they're already out there. They've watched her videos, they follow the George Floyd protests, and January 6th, they're on TikTok and Twitch. On a technical level, live streaming has never been easier. But it's not about easier. It's not about software or phones. That's what Ohun hopes the live streamers of today recognize. Ohun got hurt doing this work. They all have. Heather, Brian, the other live streamers, pepper sprayed on camera, thrown to the ground by police, 
detained in cold cells, wrists bent back in too tight handcuffs, charged with crimes, threatened online. She knows the risks, what can be lost, and she wants them to know, we need you. That work is extremely important, and it's also very difficult because not only are you active in the protest, you are also being a voice for the people who are following online. So you're wearing these like dual hats. Um, and again, just thank you for doing that work because it is hard work. It is tiring work because you wear so many responsibilities when you hit record. We'll be back after the break. Welcome back. Now, I'm going to say something that probably sounds pretty obvious. But just because you call yourself a journalist or a live streamer or anything, really, it doesn't mean you stop being you. When you're filming, your experiences, your baggage, that doesn't just disappear. What if you're at a protest whose cause you agree with? Do you join in the chanting or do you just describe what's happening as neutrally as possible? What if you see something that genuinely makes you angry? Are there lines you can cross between live streamer and protester? And if there are, well, who gets to draw them? During the Ferguson protest, there was one live streamer, Bassam Masri, who pushed that line more than any other. Producer Danny Wisentowski wanted to know why. To try to understand Bassam Masri, I first went to Umar Lee. Tell us where we are again. We're at Old Town Donuts in Florissant, Missouri, North St. Louis County, uh, just a few miles uh, from where uh, Mike Brown was shot and killed. And across from it is Fritz's Frozen Custard, which I believe was an old A&W root beer stand, if I'm not mistaken. And this is kind of traditional North County. Umar is a writer and community activist who, for years, drove a cab around St. Louis. He has an unusual background. Growing up in a white Protestant household, he converted to Islam in the 1990s. He's full of St. Louis stories, and he is the best tour guide I have ever met. It was in his cab that I first got an introduction to places like Ferguson and Florissant, Overland and Kinloch, and this place that many here simply call North County. These were traditionally blue collar towns, and they boomed after the 1950s because of the GI Bill, the interstate highway, the desegregation of St. Louis public schools, and white flight. The same story happened many other places around the country. I bumped into Umar a lot in 2014. While I reported on the protests for the Riverfront Times, Umar was joining those protests, capturing hours of video. Like Heather, Brian, and Ohan, he was a citizen journalist. Here's Umar during the riot around that quick trip on August 10th, recording as people rushed in to loot it. Well, I had a quick trip with Anthony and started, and uh, looting him, ran San from Trick Trip. But I'm not at Old Town Donuts with Umar just for another tour of North County history. I've asked him to meet with me to talk about someone who is arguably the most controversial figure of the Ferguson protests. Because if Edward Skeeta Crawford represents something iconic about the Ferguson uprising, then Bassam Masri is something close to infamous. No less than the New York Times described him as the unofficial videographer of the Ferguson protest movement and one of its chief provocateurs. My name is Bassam. I'm here in St. Louis to protest injustice anywhere there is. This is the earliest video of Bassam that I can find from Ferguson. He uploaded it to Facebook on August 11, 2014. It's a selfie shot video, his face lit by police lights as he approaches a protest. What you need to understand about Bassam Masri is that he established himself as a live streamer with a particular viewpoint. As a Palestinian American, Bassam connected what he was seeing in Ferguson to what was happening in Gaza. A 17-year-old kid got shot and killed yesterday by police in Ferguson. 
and uh, people have rioted because of it. I'm here to remind them there are 439 children that have died in Gaza in the last year. When the Ferguson protests broke out, the 2014 Gaza war was weeks away from ceasefire, with Israel and Hamas still in open conflict and Palestinian health officials reporting hundreds of deaths of children. But Palestinians in Gaza were following the news in Ferguson. They tweeted at the protesters with tips for dealing with tear gas, noticing that the U.S.-made munitions fired off in Ferguson were the exact same ones shot at them in Gaza. From listening to Bassam, it was about standing up to oppression. He made this point repeatedly, profanely, to police officers responding to protests. He got in their faces, berating them in a way that few people dared to do. You think I'm scared of me? I'm from Gaza. Do you, any of you know what Gaza is? Do any of you know what Gaza is? All right, then you guys will know I am not scared of nothing but God. But God, none of you scare me. You guys are not staying silent in the, fore, in the face of injustice is causing to this problem right here, right now. Your brothers killed a 17-year-old kid for nothing. What is the answer? What is the answer? Violence? Are you willing? You want to? You want to? You, you want to take me to jail? Throw me in a cage like an animal? Children are too precious for this. Our children's blood is not worth this. Umar Lee, my North County tour guide, knew Bassam from a young age. He calls Bassam's upbringing here an accident of history. See, Bassam's family was originally from Jerusalem. They lived in a refugee camp after Israel's 1967 war, and Bassam's father, Zudi, came to St. Louis in the 1980s, and he would spend the next decades opening up corner stores. Um, so I first knew Bassam as Lil Zudi, which was his nickname, uh, because his father had a uh, very uh, well-known store in the O'Fallon Park neighborhood in North St. Louis. Bassam used to you know, work at the store, and I used to work for one of Bassam's relatives, and so that's kind of my introduction to him. Mike Brown's death seemed to activate something in Bassam. He took things much further than other live streamers. He got in cops' faces. You will never be safe, ever in your life. None of you. Now you, now your children, none of you will be safe. Umar says he didn't want Bassam to get in trouble, but he never talked with him about why he approached police in that way. He was full throttle. You know, if he would say something too wild, I would tell him, I would say, hey man, you know, just think about it. You know, you might think it, but you ain't necessarily got to say it. Bassam was a constant presence in the Ferguson protests and in the years of protests that followed. At one point, Bassam created his own kind of news cycle. He had faced criminal charges for allegedly spitting on an officer, and a local TV news channel published an extensive list of Bassam's criminal records, of traffic tickets, a suspended license. It aired footage from Bassam's live stream telling officers, I'm praying for your death. For a certain audience, Bassam became a kind of anti-celebrity. Trolls followed him and mirrored his streams for their own chat rooms to mock and document. But there was a reason behind Bassam's anger. It wasn't just about what was taking place in Gaza, but what was happening in North St. Louis County. Here's how his cousin, Faisan Sayed, describes it. And Bassam, growing up like many other Palestinians, he would work in his dad's shop. He worked in the predominantly African-American community, and he would be in that shop for hours at a time. So as Bassam was growing up, he really saw himself not apart from that community, but really part of the North City community, part of the African-American community. A lot of his friends are African-Americans, grew up in that area, and his personality and whatnot really reflected that type of reality. That reality also shaped his view of the police and the power and terror they could wield. You can hear this part of Bassam in another video of his. It's from November 19th, 2014, He's filming directly outside the Ferguson Police Department. Bassam, as usual, is face to face with a cop who is decked out in a helmet, face mask, and body armor. They've only abused us. We've never touched any of them. 
they victimized all of us. That's why we're all out here. We ain't out here for, for shits and giggles. You know what I'm saying? Every ticket, every warrant, every everything that y'all ever done to oppress us, we don't want to this is the manifestation of that, no, along with our blood on the street. So you got nothing to blame but yourself. Bassam turns the camera toward the protest line, so we can't see what the officers do next. But we can hear them. Sam, you're under arrest. If you got for your arrest, you're under arrest. Umar Lee, it turns out, is in the crowd as well, filming from a different angle. He's close enough to hear Bassem berating the cops. So we got uh, Flores and police. We got no name uh, cop. University of Missouri, St. Louis, St. Louis County. Uh, I thought I saw Missouri Highway Patrol badge here. All right. Here we go. My man Bassem on the front row. Just as soon as Umar says those words, you can hear the officers announce the arrest. As always. Oh, 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 oh. Awesome. Who they get? What for? Who they get? What do they do? Who do they just arrest? That night, Bassam is among five people arrested outside the Ferguson Police Department. But as you can hear in the video, He's the only one informed directly about his warrants as officers close in. It's not the first time that the police single him out, or the last. Umar says that Bassem wasn't that angry version of himself all the time, but he had his demons. My sister had hired him, and he was uh, uh, selling life insurance, and he was a very talented salesman. And he loved to talk about Ferguson, he loved to talk about the policy of struggle, uh, and he loved to talk about his addictions. And uh, he was very open about that. It's true. Bassem was public about his history with addiction to heroin. He tweeted about getting sober, about using Narcan to save someone's life, and how he was helping others escape what he called the most addictive drug on earth. It's October 6, 2018, the last video of Bassa Masri's that I can find before his death. I don't know if y'all can hear him yet, but we're walking up on him now. How's everybody doing today? All right, now that we got a few viewers, I just want to let you all know that this is not TVPG. There might be some profanity, etc. So if there's any- He's in Clayton the seat of government of St. Louis County, and the location of the office of U.S. Senator Roy Blunt. All week, people have been protesting here against the appointment of Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. They're arresting people right now. As y'all can see. Fight back! Fight back! Officers arrest the demonstrators, and Bassam joins in the chanting. After the arrests, he makes his way to the sidewalk. He spots a familiar face. Miss Jupiter. It's part of my disability, my joints disability. Look, it's Heather, y'all. Oh, my bones. Hey, Bass. Hey, uh, What's up, man? How you doing? You all right? Oh, not really. I'm in the pain, but I'm here. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. It's okay. You're always there. Bass and Masri never stopped speaking out. About police, about Ferguson, about Gaza... He seemed to thrive when taunting armed police officers covered in body armor. About a month after the protest in Clayton, Bassam was found unresponsive on a bus in St. Louis County. Efforts to revive him failed. A toxicology report later showed fentanyl in his system. He was just 31 years old. Umar Lee was in Dallas when he got the news. He returned to St. Louis for Bassam's funeral. He says it came as a complete shock. Actually, I thought he was doing well. Like, he seemed to me that he was doing well. Uh, but other people that knew him better than I did, it, you know, said, you know, he was struggling. Yeah. Bassam left behind a legacy. Live streamers like Heather DeMayan still talk about him, about the way he inspired them to keep going, to keep filming. The live stream 
you know, Bassam called it an alibi. It's like they, they can't accuse you of something, doing something that you weren't doing because you have the live stream proving where you were and where everybody was. <laughs> Bassam also led a complicated life. And some will say he wasn't a protester or a live streamer, but a provocateur, an agitator. Bassam isn't around for us to ask him about that. We're left to grapple with his anger, the way he expressed it, and the impact he left behind. Umar says it's complicated. And I think it's almost like religion. When you try to figure out the internal of somebody else, what motivates them? Or as we say in, in Arabic, their niyat, their intention. You don't, you know, you know, only the person knows what what the their intention is, right? And so something inside of him gave him this motivation, something he observed, something he lived, how he viewed how the police dealt with the community, uh, how he viewed the police dealt with those in O'Fallon Park where he grew up working in the store, or those in North County where he grew up. All these things were internalized within Bassam, and then the action came out. At that time, it was activated on, on August 9th, yeah. Ferguson activated a lot of people. It activated me in ways that I never could have prepared for in journalism school. It's what has defined my time here as a reporter in St. Louis, my realization that the Ferguson uprising wasn't confined to 2014 or to the St. Louis region, I saw it in the protests, in the communities that rose up to demand justice in 2015, 2016, 2017, all the way to today. I saw it on the live streams. I saw Heather, Ohun, Bassam out on the streets, their videos creating an in-the-moment history, something that wasn't for an audience or for ratings, but for a community fighting for its future. Unlike those citizen journalists, I got to leave those moments. I got to leave Ferguson. I wasn't hounded by trolls posting my personal information or criminal history online. I didn't lose my job like Umar Lee did when his bosses at the cab company saw him attending protests in a work vehicle. I didn't get arrested like Ohun, Heather, and Bassam. I played it safe because I could. Because I was just trying to catch up. They were leading the way. That was producer Danny Wissentowski. After the break, we go to church and we say goodbye to a Ferguson icon. We're back. We began this episode with a look at the life of Edward Skeeta Crawford and the photo that made him famous. His life ended tragically on May 5th, 2017. St. Louis City Police reported he had been riding in the backseat of a car, driving east near Hyde Park. Two women were in the car with him. According to police, the witnesses said he began expressing he was distraught over personal matters. Then, they heard the sound of rummaging in the back seat. Then, a gunshot. His death was determined by the medical examiner's office as suicide, a shot to the head. But many people don't believe that conclusion. Some say it could have been an accidental discharge or that something else happened. That's what Skeeta's father, Edward Crawford Sr. believes. He did not commit suicide. He was born in May. He had birthday parties planned. He was going out of town. It was my mother's 70th birthday party. He was so excited to to see that, to go to that. And he had uh, plans to uh, go to I forgot, Vegas or something. He, he had already paid for his tickets and everything. So he was about life. And the night that he died or was murdered, he was out celebrating so-called with friends or family, and he was happy. No matter what happened, the loss was devastating. It still is. 
not just to his family, but the people who had their eyes opened by that photo. The image of a black man wrapped in the American flag under attack by police, giving proof through the night that an uprising was here. Skeeta's death isn't settled. You'll still hear his name spoken among other notable Ferguson protesters like Bassam Masri or activist Darren Seals, who was found murdered in a burning car in 2016. Many still wonder if there was something else going on, a conspiracy, a pattern, but that's not what people are talking about on May 15th, 2017 at the Greater Faith Missionary Baptist Church in St. Louis, the funeral for Edward Skeeta Crawford, his celebration of life. The church is packed. Many of the attendees are wearing American flag t-shirts. Reporters are covering the event, the death of an icon. Rising first to speak is attorney Gerald Christmas. My name is attorney Gerald Christmas. Uh, Edward was my client and he was also my friend. Uh, over the last three years, I've been representing him in Ferguson. You know, Edward had the courage to throw that tear gas canister away from those children. Yeah. He became iconic in the Black Lives Matter movement. All right, all right. And he was also an inspiration to me. Mm. And I worked with Edward because Ferguson had trumped up charges against him. Mm. We were in the process of getting those charges resolved where he would have no criminal record. Skeeta didn't live long enough to see his criminal charges resolved or to fully embrace his role in the legacy of the Ferguson uprising. What he left behind? It's more than a photo can contain. That's what his mother, Cynthia, wants people to understand about her son. He was everything you see in that photo and more. He really didn't get treated like a celebrity. He went on to try to do his day-to-day -day life, you know. He take care of his take children. Take care of his kids, go to yeah, work, right? come home. I mean, it, it bothered him to the point where it just... You know, he know in his heart that he wasn't trying to hurt an officer. He didn't know what the outcome would be. But I stood behind my son. And I still, every, um, on his birthday, I wear the flag shirt, the, the flags. I got a flag in my house. I got a flag, you know, just remembering that we do live in America. And, and I guess with that picture, stand up for what's right. That was Skeeta. That was the live streamers, the protesters. They showed up. They didn't stop being themselves when they picked up the camera. Actually, just the opposite. It wasn't a time to stay on the sidewalk, to think about the risks, to listen to the trolls. No one knew where the protest would take us or what the consequences were. It didn't matter. They couldn't stop moving us forward because we couldn't stay where we were, trapped in the smoke. This episode was produced by Danny Wisentowski and edited by Emily Woodbury. With production assistance from Chad Davis and Ella Kuziz, and audio mixing and podcast design by Greg Muntineau. We received editorial guidance from Brian Heffernan, Chris Houston is our executive producer. Special thanks to Marissa Ann Lewis Thompson. Our theme music was inspired by Cassie Morgan and remixed by Mastermind. We Live Here is a production of St. Louis Public Radio in collaboration with the Midwest Newsroom. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.